This is a video walking you through the entire um, dew point and relative humidity lab for geosystems. So let's get started. All right, we're going to start here with this video explaining the concepts for today's lab. Hey everybody, Vince Candela from Fox 6 with our video weather notes. Can you see or feel the moisture that's in the air? We can easily see it anytime you have a, a cold glass of water, let's say, on a very warm and humid day. The ice cubes inside this glass chill the outside of the glass, drop the temperature down to the dew point, and then the moisture that's in the air condenses out onto the side of the glass. And there's the concept, dew point. So many people are confused. They like relative humidity because they've always heard that concept, but they don't understand dew point. Here's one way to think about it. It's what the temperature that we need to cool the air down to in order for water to condense. So if I can drop this air temperature on the side of this glass down to our dew point, any moisture, invisible moisture, water vapor that's in the air, we can make visible and condense it out. Here's another way to think about relative humidity. It's relative to the actual air temperature. So consider these two boxes. They're very different in size. This would be representative of very warm air. It can hold a lot of moisture. It has the capacity to hold a lot of moisture. This is representative of cold air. It can't hold as much moisture as warm air can. Well, relative humidity is relative to the actual air temperature. So let's say if the relative humidity is 50%, well, that means that half of the air is filled with its capacity for water vapor. Well, 50% of this is a lot more than 50% of this. So a 50% relative humidity on a warm day is a lot more moisture in the air than 50% relative humidity on a cool day. So again, relative humidity is relative to the air temperature and it differs depending on the actual temperature of the air. The better measure is dew point. And by the way, dew point's a great measure for comfort. Dew point's below 60 degrees, pretty comfortable for all of us. Dew points above 70, getting very sticky and uncomfortable for most of us as well. So it's sort of a mindset, a change in definition. Dew point much more representative of the moisture that's in the air compared to relative humidity. I'll see you on... Hey everybody, Vince Candela from Fox. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our vocabulary. So if everyone opens up your, your dew point and relative humidity lab in Schoology... We can go ahead, you can just cut and paste those definitions, but let's make sure that you have them all correct. So as you go through the lab, pause this video when you need to, to fill in your answers and do your work and then come back to the video. All right, so we're going to start with specific humidity. Specific humidity is the mass of water vapor in a unit mass of moist air. Okay, and it's usually in grams of water per kilogram of air. Relative humidity is expressed as a percent. It is the ratio of the specific humidity over the vapor capacity, and we'll, make, we'll do this, um, this calculation in the lab. It's often converted to a percent, as I said. The capacity, that's the total amount of water vapor a kilogram of air can hold at any certain temperature. Saturation is the state that occurs when no more water vapor can be added to the air. You're at 100% capacity when you're saturated. Condensation, this is familiar from the water cycle. The conversion of a vapor or a gas to a liquid or the water which collects as droplets on a cold surface when humid air is in contact with it. Evaporation is the process of turning from a liquid into a vapor or gas state. The dew point. That is the temperature at which the air becomes saturated and condensation occurs. So and when we think about these concepts, we're looking at a, um, a chart like this. And we can get a couple different things from this chart. All right, so this is the temperature down at the bottom. Uh, and then this is the vapor capacity. How much water vapor can the air hold at a given temperature? Um, and so if you are looking at dew point, for example, if we look at the dew point down here, the temperature dew point, then we can use this curve to get the specific humidity in grams per kilogram. 
um, and we'll do an example of that in the lab. But if we're looking at air temperature down here, and we can use the graph the same way, then we're not getting the specific humidity, but we're getting the vapor capacity. Okay, so we can use this chart in a couple different ways. So let's go ahead and do part two of the lab together right now. So open up your lab and we are going to go to, you've done your vocab, let's do part two together. So again, this is a graph um, which shows temperature versus water vapor or specific humidity. The curve on the graph shows the relationship between the dew point and specific humidity also shows the relationship between air temperature and vapor capacity, but be sure you don't mix those two up. Notice that the higher the air temperature, so here's our temperature down below here, the higher the air temperature, the greater the capacity of the air to hold water vapor. So that's why it feels humid in summer. Notice the temperatures are hot over here on the right-hand side of the graph, and the the air is able to hold a lot more water vapor or it feels humid and sticky. On the opposite side over here, this is cold winter over here. So it's cold and notice, is the air able to hold a lot of water vapor? No, it does not get very humid in winter. So we have hot, humid summers and we have low humidity, dry winters. And this chart is the reason why it feels that way. So pretty, pretty mind blowing. All right, so let's keep going here and answer these questions together. So here's number one. So we're just gonna go through these one at a time. I'm gonna leave this chart up in the video and answer these questions together. So number one, as temperature increases, is the air able to hold more or less water vapor? And notice that as the temperature increases, the air is able to hold more water vapor. Number one, more water vapor. Number two, in which season would you be more likely to use a dehumidifier? A dehumidifier is a machine that removes moisture from the air. So when would you use that? You would tend to use a dehumidifier in summer when there's too much humidity, too much water vapor in the air. So number two, in summer. Number three, in which season would you be more likely to use a humidifier or a machine that adds moisture to the air? And the answer would be in winter. When it feels very dry, your skin probably feels dry. Um, you're putting on a lot of lotion on your hands because the air is so, so dry. So in number three, in winter. All right, now let's get specific with reading this graph. Number four, if the dew point is 10 degrees Celsius, then the specific humidity would be what? And so I am right here. So here's zero, negative temperatures, positive temperatures. 10 degrees would be right here. I go up to this and I go across. And what would that be? Uh, about seven grams per kilogram. The specific humidity in this case at 10 degrees for a dew point would be about seven grams per kilogram. All right, so similarly, I can use this graph for air temperature and vapor capacity. So let's say the air temperature is 30 degrees C. Here we go. We have the dew point at 10, but the air temperature is 30 degrees C. That's over here, but halfway between 20 and 40. Then I go up, 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 up. I'm gonna to try to figure out what the vapor capacity is. That's on the Y axis. If I go up to here and across, the vapor capacity, oh, let's call it about 27 grams per kilogram, somewhere around there. All right, so number five, 27 grams per kilogram. Now, how do you calculate the relative humidity? You divide specific humidity by the vapor capacity. So if our dew point, um, if our specific humidity is seven grams per kilogram and our vapor capacity is 27 grams per kilogram, we divide those, multiply by 100, we get 26%, 26%, so that's number six. All right, let's keep going through this. So we'll go back to our, to our slideshow here. Now, if we could know the actual specific humidity, 
of the air and the capacity of that same kilogram of air, or we already knew the air temperature and dew point, it would be extremely easy to compute the relative humidity. The problem in real life is we do not know these quantities. So instead, we use a tool called a sling psychrometer to measure relative humidity. So this is an instrument that has two thermometers on it. One has a cotton sleeve, which is wetted before use. So that gives us what's called the wet bulb temperature. The other thermometer is bare, gives us a dry bulb temperature. So that's equal to the air's temperature. You swing the sling psychrometer, causes the water to evaporate from the wet bulb, where it has the wet sleeve on it, cools the bulb, reduces the temperature. So the wet bulb temperature is always going to be lower than the dry bulb temperature. Compare the wet bulb and the dry bulb temperatures, use experimentally determined charts, which I'm going to provide to you, and that allows us to determine the dew point temperature and the relative humidity of the air in the classroom or outside if you're on the football field, the soccer field, the softball field, whatever you're using. So let's watch this as an example of using a sling psychrometer. And you might notice if you're an athlete or if you watch sports, they're using sling psychrometers. It's very common. We use them here even at South Lake. So let's watch this. To the fans that might be considered the most overlooked position on the team, USM's football athletic trainers are responsible for the player's health from injuries to hydration and so much more. But the weather in Mississippi makes things different. The humidity is a big factor with us because when you have the humidity, it doesn't allow your sweat to evaporate. So you're holding that heat in your body, whereas in a cooler environment or an environment with less humidity, that sweat's able to evaporate off of them and cool them off. Since humidity can impact a player's health, the trainers are routinely checking the exact humidity in the air. They gather this data by using a sling psychrometer. This little gadget measures the dry air temperature and wet bulb temperature to formulate the humidity. And we sling it for about five minutes. And after that time's up, we'll take it and get our readings off of here. We get a dry reading, which is the dry air temperature, and also a wet reading. And we take those two readings, slide it into this neat little slide rule here. We take our wet reading and our dry reading and line it up, and that arrow points to the relative humidity. Depending upon the humidity, the trainers can then determine how to treat the players to avoid dehydration and heat illnesses. It sounds simple, but we encourage them to take their helmets off when they're not on the field, just to be able to get, get a little bit of that breeze, get a little bit of that cooling effect. Um, we have ice towels um, put on their heads just to help cool their body temperature, cool them off. Um, Obviously, we encourage them to drink. Um, that's the best way to cool your body is to drink. The trainer's steps to prevent heat-related issues are always a major concern when the players are running hard under the high humidity and heat of South Mississippi. Because what people don't realize is, yeah, there's heat illness involved, but there's also, you know, you're breaking their body down with the heat, too. So it could lead to other injuries. It could lead to, you know, other illnesses. Now you'll continue to see the trainers whirl the sling psychrometer to help the players perform at the top of their ability. For Sports Journal, I'm Tanner Cade. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, video and you may use that for, um, for if you're in any sports. So this is very, things that make a lot of difference in our actual life and are used. All right, so here is a picture of a Mason's hygrometer. This is similar to a sling psychrometer where you have a dry bulb temperature and a wet bulb temperature. We're going to use that in the next part of our lab. So let's move on to part three. Everybody can move on here and look at part three. So instead of looking at the actual Mason's hygrometer in the classroom, I've given you the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature. And notice we're going to put that in as 24 degrees C for the dry bulb and a wet bulb temperature is 20 degrees C. So the first thing we want to do here is find the difference between the two. So the difference between the two is, of course, 24 minus 20. That's 4 degrees Celsius is the difference. So once you have the, the dry bulb temperature and you have the difference, then you can use 
the chart here, if you click here, you can find that to find the dew point and the relative humidity. So let's go to the experimentally determined chart and find the difference. So here we are, notice this chart. So this has on this axis over here, the dry bulb temperature. So for us, the dry bulb temperature was 24 degrees C. So we're gonna be looking on this line right here, all the way across. The difference was four degrees, the difference between wet bulb and dry bulb. So notice we don't ever use the wet bulb except to get the difference. So we are looking at the intersection of the difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb, which is four degrees C and the dry bulb. So right here, I circle that right there, is 18 degrees C. That's the answer to number two, the dew point temperature. And this is how you use it, 18 degrees C. All right, now we can also use this chart. We're gonna use the relative humidity chart, also experimentally determined, in order to get the, rel the um, relative humidity. So let's do the same thing. We have the dry bulb temperature over here. In our case, that's 24 degrees. We're gonna go right there. And the difference between the two is four degrees. So we're gonna come right down here to get the relative humidity. We have 24 degrees four degrees difference, and that number is 69%, 69% relative humidity. Now, the question is, how much colder would the air temperature have to get to reach the dew point? Okay, the dew point is when the air becomes saturated, okay? Well, we know the dry bulb air temperature is 24, that's the air temperature, and the dew point we found is 18 degrees C. So if we go 24 minus 18, the air temperature would have to drop six degrees C to reach the dew point. So the answer there to number th in number three, six degrees C. If the air temperature was equal to the dew point, then the relative humidity would be 100% saturated, 100%. Number four, if we could lower the air temperature in the room to the dew point temperature, would the condensation forming on your desk be dew or frost? The answer, it would be dew. Why? Because it's not freezing. We're above 32 degrees Fahrenheit in the room or zero degrees Celsius. So it would be dew. If we were below freezing in the classroom, then it would it would come out and condense as frost, as ice crystals. All right, let's keep going. This is part four, analysis questions. On a summer day, so let me show you where we are. We're in part four, analysis questions. Now, give you an opportunity to kind of work on this again and think through it. So number one, on a summer day, the air temperature, the dry bulb temperature is 30 degrees C, and the wet bulb temperature is 20 degrees C. So first thing you do, the dry bulb minus the wet bulb temperature. That is 10 degrees C, 30 minus 20, 10 degrees C. So we use the chart, click the chart. What is the dew point? And we can come over here. We have the dry bulb temperature is 30 degrees. So, oh, we gotta get to our dew point. Here we go, the top one, 30 degrees C, and the difference is 10. So here we go, and notice that number where those two intersect is 14, um, is 14 degrees C, that's the dew point. Let's do the same for the relative humidity. Our dry bulb temperature is 30 degrees, our difference is 10 degrees, we come down here, and what do we have? 39% relative humidity, right there. So we just came across and down 39 degrees. All right, if, number two, if the dew point temperature is very low, then will the specific humidity be high or low? It will be low. Think of the chart that we have over here. Let me go back. So if the dew point temperature is low over here, then the specific humidity be what? It'll be low. Specific humidity is on the y-axis, dew point uh, temperature on the x-axis here. It'll be low. Number three, consider another 
scenario in which the dew point is far from the air temperature. In this case, the, the dry bulb temperature is 30 degrees and the wet bulb temperature is 16 degrees. So first thing we do, find the difference. Dry bulb minus wet bulb would be 30 minus 16 degrees C would be 14 degrees C here, 14 degrees C. The dew point temperature, again, using the chart, if we have a dry bulb temperature of 30, we're down here, and a difference of 14, we're way out here. Oh, I'm on relative humidity. I go back up to dew point. If, we're, if my dry bulb is 30, my difference is 14, then my dew point temperature is five degrees. I can do the same in relative humidity. My dry bulb temperature is 30 degrees. My difference between wet bulb and dry bulb is 14 degrees, big difference. Then my relative humidity is 20%. Is this relative humidity of 20%, is that considered high or low? And that is low, that is low. Often in a summer day, you'll have 80% humidity. Um, um, and that, so 20% is quite low. You're, that air is gonna feel very dry to you. Number five, why does a cold beverage can sweat on a hot summer day? Um, well, because the glass is cold from the cold beverage inside the glass. So the dew point is actually reached in the air just surrounding the glass. Um, that's, and so that, that dew point is air, that air capacity, the relative humidity is 100% right around the coolness of the glass and that water vapor in the air comes out, condenses onto the side of the glass. So similarly, number six, why will a pair of glasses fog up when you walk into a sauna? Um, the glasses are cooler than the humid air um, in the sauna. So the water vapor again comes out of the air and condenses onto the relatively cooler glasses. So that's why your glasses fog up um, when you go from inside a cool air conditioned space into a hot summer day or into a sauna, for example. All right, awesome. So the last part, part five, is just the summary of this whole thing, I want you to use the word bank here. This is all of our vocabulary words and let's use them in context. Um, each word above is used only one time. Go ahead and cut and paste them where they go and let's go ahead and read this through together to make sure it makes sense. Um, so why don't you pause the video, give it a try and then come back and check your work. So on a clear warm day, water vapor is in the air. However, during a cloudless night, most infrared radiation or heat from the Earth's surface is transmitted back to outer space, resulting in decreased temperatures overnight. In the morning, you notice dew has formed on the grass and windshields of cars. This happened because the temperature fell overnight until it reached the dew point which is the temperature at which the air becomes saturated with water vapor. The amount of water vapor in the air exceeds the moisture capacity of the cooler night air, forcing the water vapor to condense on the grass. In the morning, during your walk to school, your shoes got wet walking through the grass. After school, the day is sunny and warm and you notice the grass is dry. During the day, the air temperature increased. This increases the air's moisture capacity, causing the dew to evaporate back into the air. Very good. So uh, now you can go do, if this is a year where we're doing the quiz, you can go do your quiz for this um, lesson and it should be ready for you in Schoology.